CYC is a free channel presents the Word of God for everyone. Your support will help us to continue the mission. Visit our website, cycnow.com. Even a dollar will make a difference. Welcome to another episode from Mythbuster. We are trying to study the Mythbuster regarding Noah's Ark. Many skeptics are really looking at the story as far as animals are concerned. How many animals were there? How many animals can be contained in that ship? God is saying seven animals and then two animals. Did he take seven from each kind or two from each kind? Is the kind is like the species? Another question is regarding what about the freshwater sea creatures? How can they were able to live in salty water? And many other questions like how did he gather all the animals and make them abide with him to enter into the ark? And what type of animals were there? I'll try to cover these questions today. Let me first handle the first question regarding did he really take from each kind or each species? And is there a difference? In Genesis 6, 19 and 20, we read, Every living thing of all flesh, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and on every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. However, they start then later on speaking about families of animals beasts, birds of heaven, and so forth. So the first thing we can notice that it wasn't clearly mentioned that he was required to take any of the sea creatures, maybe because they are able to live. Of course, we have to handle the question, how can a freshwater creature live in a salty water creature in a few minutes? So basically, he was taking the land-dwelling or the air-breathing animals that needed protection from the flood. In Genesis 6, 19 and 20, and in Genesis 7, 2 and 3, God commands Noah to take two of each kind of unclean animal and seven of each kind of clean animals. However, we need to remember that the Hebrew or Genesis word for the word kind in Hebrew means min, M-I-N, is not the same as species, as the biologists like to use. So he was not required to take two and seven from each species, but rather from each kind. What I mean is, he does not have to take from golden retriever and, and golden shepherd and then yellow lap and coyote. They are all within the kind of dogs. So he will take two of these. The next question we need to handle was he required to take two or seven? So in Genesis 2 to 4, it states, Of every clean beast you shall take seven and seven, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean, two, the male and his female, and of the birds of the heaven, seven and seven, male and female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Some scholars are very decisive in this matter, claiming that our Lord requested seven from each clean animal. The reason is at that time, which is the patriarchal age, the idea of sacrificing a clean animal to God was already taught by Adam to his descendants up till Noah. So it's almost accepted logically that there were extra animals in the clean ones that he would need to sacrifice to God for him to accept the offering. So you can almost imagine that instead of the seven, one animal from each clean kind was delivered as an offering, leaving three pairs to continue to uh, procreate later on. 
However, other scholars were not as decisive and said this is unclear in the biblical text. One of them is John uh, Willis, who published in 1979 a documentary on, on uh, this account saying it could be 14 uh, animals from each kind rather than seven. So I'll leave it to your own thinking, but as I can tell you, uh, after reading many of these scholars, it seems the more logic opinion is what I just mentioned, that the seventh animal will be sacrificed, leaving three pairs to procreate. Now, coming to the interesting questions. How many animals are we thinking of? A very renounced evolutionary taxonomist, Ernest Mayer, have really published a very important document trying to approximate the number and types of animals that probably were taken on board the ship. Basically, he says, mammals, 3,700. Birds, 8,600. Reptiles, 6,300. Amphibians, 2,500, making the total 21,000 100 different species, and if you multiply that two for every unclean animal, we are talking about 42,200 different animals were taken. Now, in his analysis, he recognized that most of these animals were taken in a smaller or medium size in order to be allowed to be fitting in the size of the ship. In a different analogy by Morris and LaHaye, they took the example of a railroad box card um, to see how many animals could be fitted, and it was in the range of 240 sheep-sized animals, making the animals that Noah's Ark could accommodate could be accommodated in almost 36% of the um, area of the Ark. John Wood Morap in 1996 published in Building on the Same Theory that actually, based on these numbers and the three-deck sized uh, arc, the, actually the size of the arc could be easily accommodating this type of medium to small sized animals. In her book, Science of the Bible, Jean Morton presented a very excellent report on how the animals are named and called in the Bible using the Hebrew terminology. So, the word fowl for birds are really meaning all the bird that flies, and the first classification is referring to those creatures that fly, um, while water living creatures, by definition, were omitted from the word uh, fowl. The cattle, however, using a Hebrew term called behema, actually is used 188 times in the Old Testament and basically translated in many ways, most of it in English like beasts or cattle. But it really means all the non-water living creatures and the non-flying creatures. Continuing on her report, um, Jean Morton writes that the final classification for creeping animals in Hebrew means remes. R-E-M-E-S, refers to the insects, reptiles, and all the smaller other creatures. Now let us handle a different question. How can a freshwater sea creatures can live in a salty water medium? Of course, there are a couple of assumptions that made with this question. Whether these assumptions were true or not is debated. The first assumption that we are claiming or assuming that the salinity or the saltness of the oceans back then in Noah's time is the same like today. Actually, there are some reports to show the reverse, that the oceans became more salty in the last few hundreds of years. The second assumption or claim that we are assuming that um, seawater creatures did not or could not live in salty water uh, medium. The third assumption, we are assuming that the ability of seawater creatures 
are the same exactly as their ability today's, in today's time as sea creatures that cannot live in saline medium. Austin and Humphreys, some of them marine biologists in 1990, reported that the salinity of oceans may have been one half of what is it currently reported today. Regarding the second assumption, Whitcomb uh, and Morris pointed out back even as 1961 in their classic text, The Genesis Flood, they reported that the water sea creatures can live in salty medium. Finally, to confirm even that this, these are all claims and assumptions, there was a very interesting research done in Columbia University, um, a, a professor in the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, that he found that the investigation of the floor of the Black Sea where we think the ark was sailing, um, showed an abrupt transition from a freshwater level um, in ice age taking to a saltwater sea in the mid-sixth uh, millennium before Christ. His evidence were that there was a distinct uh, fauna and flora replacement, denoting that there is an abrupt transition from fresh into salty water. There was also complete disappearance of some coastal lines and uh, desert plains. And finally, because there was a shift in the isotopic formation and composition of the shells found in the excavations of these sites. As you can see, so far we are trying to look at scientific evidence and in the same time look at the biblical text and see the concordance. But remember, we believe that the Bible is authentic without any falsification in it. And if science cannot prove it, only it's a matter of time until it does. All of these times we were living, being faithful to the Bible. Now we see more and more science proofs to the authenticity of the Bible. Now, at the end of the day, a miracle cannot be explained by science. At the end of the day, a person walking in the water cannot be explained by science. A person who resurrects after three days cannot be explained by science. We are trying to do a mythbuster that doesn't mean we, our worship and bowing down and understanding, meaning really putting our minds under the Bible, has to come first. This is, was an episode of Mythbuster. Next time, we'll have another one dealing with excavations and also many other questions regarding Noah's Ark. Thank you.